This episode is sponsored by Hihachi Mishima. Where are its legs? Man, aren't relatives just a big old pain in the ass? They're like a big bucket of ice cream with no label. When you first get it, you've got no idea what kind of flavor you're in for. Maybe it's a pleasant mint chocolate chip, a lavish and rich rocky road, or maybe you're one of the poor bastards that gets a spoonful of hand tacks. Not everything is as sweet as it should be. Come and get your Tootsie Rolls! And until you're an adult, you're pretty much stuck with that congealed mess of melting dairy, barring the intervention of the ice cream services. This is all to say that, while there are countless great families and flavors out there, sometimes you get stuck with a raw deal and, for some unfortunate souls, they even find themselves growing accustomed to those rotten flavors and keep asking for more. What? Well, take that steak! The hell you say? Did you win World War II? This ribeye is for my daddy. Overstretched dessert metaphors aside, this is the episode that finally gives us a proper introduction to Hank's father, Cotton Hill, who has been seen since the pilot episode, but only in flashbacks and dream sequences. This is where the man himself appears in all of his mangled glory. And before we get into the review proper, I did want to acknowledge that there are quite a few people out there who strongly dislike Cotton, and I want to say that I completely understand. After all, Cotton is a raging misogynist, is emotionally abusive to pretty much everyone on the planet, and is generally a bitter old man. And for some folk, Cotton isn't just a character in a TV show, he's someone that actually exists within their own family, be they an overbearing parent, a nightmarish grandparent, or someone that tends to come to all of those tiresome family gatherings. And even if he's not a family member, there are tons of people like Cotton out there in the world, be they a co-worker, a friend of a friend, or, God forbid, your boss. These people, both old and young, are enormous pains in the ass, and, most of the time, challenging them directly would make a tense situation even worse, so they are allowed to rage on without anyone calling them out. But even without all of that, some people just find Cotton to be a total asshole, and that's the end of the story. They don't want to see him, he's just too much, get out of here, and that's fine. However, for me anyway, there's a few important factors about Cotton that keep him from being unwatchable. For one, he is not really in a true position of authority, and therefore his actual influence on the rest of the cast is only based on the attention they give him. If we compare him to other hated characters from the television world, be they Todd of Breaking Bad, or Joffrey from Game of Thrones, or even Kai Wynn from Deep Space Nine, they tend to possess a degree of authority over other characters, something that makes them untouchable or a hindrance to the protagonist's actions or the plot in general. There's also characters who are just so far up their own ass and so self-important that it's hard to imagine how they even live. There's also people who won't go away, people who just do evil or stupid things for no reason, poorly written characters, characters that are intended to be funny but aren't, or characters that only exist to do a one-note joke. But Cotton doesn't really have any of that. He's a much more passive sort of jerk, one who sits at your dinner table and occasionally tosses insults your way. And the other thing, and this is kind of a big one for me, and I don't mean to sound insensitive here, but just fucking look at him! <laughs> Look at him! He's this weird, wrinkled, shinless old man! If he were a kind-hearted and easy-going guy, would that really match his design? Not at all! This is a guy who's bitter to the core, one who's been pickled and left out in the sun. To me, saying that Cotton is a jerk, and one that should be taken seriously, is like saying that Uncle Ruckus should be considered a wellspring of well-thought-out arguments and truths. They aren't hiding some secret wisdom, they're the jesters of our little court, the fools who can say any outlandish or wild things because they wear the outfit of a clown. This doesn't give him a free pass to do anything, but it does allow him a degree of freedom that many other characters don't have. And finally, a big part of why Cotton stays fresh and interesting is that he's not a core character, and sometimes we go quite a while without seeing him. Imagine if this guy was around all the time. That would be way too much of an overload. I mean, the guy even says it himself. You really outdid yourself this time. Well, you know me, I'm larger than life. So with all the preamble out of the way, let's begin the review and see just what makes Cotton Hill a fantastic comedic force, but an unforgivable father. 
the episode begins with an extremely absurdist gag where the Hills are preparing for Bobby's upcoming birthday party, adorning the room with these flaccid balloons. Hank comes in and mentions that the invitation to his father was returned, and it's because Bobby addressed the letter to Hell USA, which is definitely located in... Insert name of your town here. Mom says he's the devil. Peggy, how can you tell Bobby that? I said evil, Hank. How you get devil from that is beyond me. This immediately sets the tone for how Peggy views Hank's dad, setting us up for one hell of a conflict. And while that's all going on, Bobby gets a little bit of body shaming in, saying that his grandfather's legs are, and I'm quoting here, more messed up than Medusa's mammogram. Damn, Bobby, what a deep cut. This allows Hank to remind the audience of his dad's, uh, unique body type. Bobby, never make fun of your grandpa's legs. He lost his shins defending Texas in World War II. So yes, let's talk about Cotton's shins, because this is a point I've been wanting to discuss. The big thing about Cotton is that he fought in World War II and, reportedly, got his shins blown off by a Japanese machine gun. And rather than just doing him the courtesy of just bandaging up his new stumps, some fucked up field med decided that their pigeon rat experiments were not enough and wanted to try attaching Cotton's feet to his knees. So let's try to forget any questions about the medical probability about this operation. Uh, although if any doctors want to start laying down their theses about this in the comments, then be my guest. But uh, what I want to talk about is how horribly cruel this act was. I mean, if he just had stumps, then Cotton could have gotten prosthetic legs, significantly improving his quality of life. And while I was writing the script for this video, uh, I spoke to my sister about this subject, and she brought up an excellent point. If Cotton had just had one of his shins blown off, would the doctor have just <laughs> attached that one foot back on? Let's get a visual aid up of what that would have looked like. And while we're here, uh, can we get a look at how some of the main characters would look if their shins had been removed? I just want to see how long their arms are. It's nuts that Cotton doesn't look like some sort of ape with his arms and leg proportions like that. My goodness. But anyway, that's enough about those shredded shins. Back to the episode. This thing is a hoop! Uh, I got a splinter here. Nice, Bill. Finally getting some good screen time there. Good for you. I'm having fun. Your wife divorced you. While waiting for Cotton to arrive, we get to see Bobby's impression of an elderly Jewish man, which elicits this rather unmumbled discussion from Boomhauer. I tell you what, fat kid's always funny one, man. Is it dang old John Candy, John Belushi, knife and fork dug their grave, man. We also get to see that there's still a little bit of lingering ignorance hanging over the gang in relation to Khan's ethnicity. If he finds out you're from Japan, you know. How many times I tell you, stupid? I'm Le Ocean! But hey, Cotton's here and he arrives in fantastic style, apparently flush with cash to spend on that horse, and immediately saves Bobby's lame ass party. In his first appearance, Cotton is in a much better financial situation than we typically see him in. I mean, he's rented that horse, bought some rather pricey gifts, and recently paid for his wife's breast expansion surgery. And once he's done his grandfatherly duty of getting Bill on that horse, Cotton begins to mingle and has a rather unique interaction with Con. He's Japanese. No, he ain't. He's Laotian. Ain't you, Mr. Khan? You know, I'm never sure of how to read this scene. Is it supposed to be impressive or offensive that Cotton is able to tell at a glance where Khan's from? He's going off purely visual cues, which must mean that he's been around a number of different people and gained an understanding of certain subtleties, but given Cotton's past interaction with Asian people, I wouldn't assume that those interactions were purely positive moments. I tend to lean more towards being impressed, but there's also something in his delivery that puts me off. While we ponder all of that, let's talk a little bit about Cotton's new wife wife, Dee Dee, who's about the same age as Hank and who has a disturbingly vacant personality. Hey Hank, do you still like finger painting? And I know this review is mostly focused on Cotton, but can I just say how Dee Dee is sort of this like really sad and creepy character? I don't know, she just seems like weirdly broken. There's just this submissiveness that defines her, and it's a real chicken-egg situation where we don't know if Dee Dee was like this before or after she met Cotton. In later episodes, we'll see her working a little bit as a nurse, and while she definitely has a softer tone of voice at this point, she's not this, like, shell of a person that we see now. 
If I had to guess, I'd say that Dee Dee was one of those people who was content living their single life, getting through day by day in a semi-satisfying job, but with her 40s on the horizon, she wanted to settle down. And then enters Cotton Hill, who, uh, <laughs> uh, well, there's no easy way to say this, might have fit into Dee Dee's oddly specific interests. They've got you in a baby gown. Oh, look at the baby. Come on, little baby boy. I'll drive you home. And that's all headcanon stuff, but really, we get so little from Dee Dee that any discussion about her is going to need to fill in a few gaps. What I can say is that for someone with the saintly compassion to put up with Cotton, she definitely doesn't get treated with any compassion. Put an apron over your new bosom, too. Don't tell her, but I got them cheap. Both lefties! Mangled tatas aside, I do want to say that Cotton is pretty awful to Dee Dee, but the writers knew when to hit the brakes at a certain point. Sure, Cotton is emotionally abusive, but he's never physical with his spouses. They sort of started to hint that he might be, but quickly backpedaled and turned it into a joke. Maybe we should think about getting back, huh, honey? What did you say? What did you say? Okay, ah, uh, now, what did you say, baby cakes? Notice here how Peggy seems to be gearing up to intervene. At least Peggy's side of the family has the guts to stand up to him. Touch me again and you'll be wearing that corn pone, old man. And speaking of, back at the party, Cotton gives Bobby a very special present, a shotgun, that Bobby then immediately points at Joseph. Well, okay, actually, it's just sort of the angle that makes it look like that. Bobby is clearly in front of Joseph, but I cringe every time I see him take it out of that box, especially since, as we'll see in a few moments, that was a loaded shotgun. So I was going to talk about how funny it is that Bobby takes so long to break that pinata, but the more I look at this scene and those odd background characters, the more weirded out I was by these weird, like, screen wipe transitions. I know there's not really any other editing trick that would have made this joke work, but it is such a weird transition for the show. You never see stuff like this. With the pinata blown away, and the candy inside no doubt filled with metal pellets, we move away from the party, and now's a good time to talk about the central conflict with Cotton, and that is that he is flagrantly, aggressively, and astonishingly sexist. That's woman's work. Leave him alone. He's a good helper. Oh, whatever you say, Hillary! Oh goodness, that Hillary line cuts a little deeper these days, wouldn't you say? I'm actually surprised that Hillary didn't take the place of Karen in our modern lexicon of insults. Maybe if it had, then my poor mother, whose name actually is Karen, wouldn't have had to suffer so. And speaking of suffering, Hank and his dad get into a minor disagreement, which almost leads to a bit of playful ceramic stabbery. Come on, grease monkey! Let's tangle! <laughs> Isn't this such an odd version of Hank? I mean, look at him. He's practically jumping up and down at the thought of his dad staying the night. This is a far cry from the emotionally distant and resentful attitude that would come to define their relationship in later episodes. I'm not bringing this up out of a like, ooh, look at how inconsistent the writing is, since that sort of criticism is pretty irrelevant in the first season of any show, but just so we can appreciate this little time capsule moment where the two seem to be honestly getting along great even if it comes at the expense of Peggy's plates. Not happy to see her property ruined, Peggy hustles Cotton out of the house and tries to bid him a less than fond farewell. But this is ruined when Cotton's car won't start, and I have no idea what's wrong with it, so can I get an expert to tell us what's going on? I can't hear the solenoid plunger. You're gonna need a new one. Hmm, you know, I'm not sure, but I think this might be the last time that Luann shows her mastery over cars. I'll keep an eye out for it in the future reviews, but it would be a darn shame if this was the last time that she showed this proficiency, because that may mean that Cotton succeeded in shaming her out of her interest. A woman fixing a car! That's like a pig trying to read! So after a little bit of back and forth arguing, where Hank tells Peggy that Cotton is more of a character, like a cowboy or a flamboyant peacock, unlike Peggy's drab peahen, Cotton stays the night and we are treated to this rather unpleasant exchange at breakfast. You will never know if you are attractive. It's up to a man to tell you that. You keep eating, and I'll tell you when to stop. I know they aren't related by blood, but that is technically his grandniece's cheeks that he's slapping, which is just the cherry on this shit Sunday. I actually examined this scene very closely because I was like, wait a minute, whoa, 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 did Hank just see his dad smack Luann's ass and not say anything? But just before that happens, Hank says his dad can borrow his truck to take Bobby to school, and he goes to rig up the pedal extenders, getting Hank out of the room, meaning he misses this encounter, phew. 
It's a really subtle thing, but one that I greatly appreciate. Hank is already doing so much to excuse his dad's behavior, and it already feels weird, but that, <laughs> seeing that happen and him saying nothing, would have been a step way too far. Now with Hank's truck in hand, instead of taking Bobby to school, Cotton brings him to a bar and teaches his grandson how to be a colossal jackass. Hey, Missy! How about some sandwiches? Thankfully, that bit of bad parenting is smoothed over by this completely unhinged and random bit of nonsense from Dale. One day my cousin woke up, his kidney was gone. At the same time, 500 miles away, a woman in Phoenix contracted diabetes. While the guys are busy standing around, reminiscing, Luann gets Cotton's car working again, meaning that the old man can get the heck out of here. But as we come to see, this bit of mechanical malfunction was anything but, as Peggy discovers the missing solenoid in Cotton's dresser drawer, meaning that he sabotaged his own car so he could stick around. It's never explicitly said why Cotton did this, it's not like it would have been that hard to convince Hank to let him stay, and there's no real end game to this plot beat. It seems like the episode is saying that Cotton wants to stick around so he can mold Bobby to become more like him, but gosh, I'm really not sure. But what I am sure of is that after spending a day with his grandfather, Bobby has begun to pick up some rather bad habits. Well, go on, woman, get me my dinner! <gasps> you know, watching Bobby go through this transformation, I have to say that I think Bobby may be, overall, the most inconsistently written character in the show. And this isn't something that's just present in the first season, but throughout the whole thing. Sometimes he's just so lost in his own little world with grand hopes and goals that it's practically impossible to get him to change even a little bit, but then there's situations like this where he's portrayed as this extremely impressionable boy who needs to be sheltered from bad influences. These inconsistencies are no doubt in place to serve the specific plot of each episode, and there would certainly be no conflict in this plot if Bobby totally disengaged from everything that Cotton was trying to say, but if Bobby were always this impressionable, then he would have been Hank 2.0 by the age of four. But maybe Cotton is just that overwhelming of a personality. He does radiate this sort of unbreakable confidence that adds a particular bit of gravity to him. Bobby, take your daddy's pants off. Once Bobby gives his mother, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna try to be diplomatic here, the old Oedipus handshake, his parents decide that something must be done about Cotton's behavior, and Hank is gonna be the one who has to do it because, as Peggy correctly points out, they're both men, they're both peacocks. Heading out to find his dad, Hank finds Cotton discussing the finer points of asbestos with the guys. This quickly morphs into an overly patriotic retelling of how Cotton got his shins blown off, and man, can I just say how much I appreciate the quality of this flash back. The production quality is insane for this point in the series. It's a piece of cinematic glory, especially the part where Cotton says, supposedly, he beat his enemies to death with a piece of his friend Fatty, which, if you're gonna beat someone to death, then using a part of a guy named Fatty is probably a pretty good choice. Unable to stand against the overwhelming might of this scene, Hank backs down from confronting his father, which means that Bobby's attitude problems are allowed to go unchecked. This leads to a moment where, when the teacher gently reminds Bobby to please bust his tray, Bobby claims that it's woman's work. After only a few chantings of woman's work, the whole cafeteria explodes into chaos, which is simultaneously the least likely and most likely thing for a bunch of kids to do. Kicking it back over to Hank's work, he's busy contemplating which side he should go with. Uh, and here's a little side note, this customer is asking Hank for service, but when the phone calls, he dismisses the dude to answer it. And that immediately flashed me back to my old job in retail, where once I got some guy asking me for an inventory check, so I went to go look, but while I was away, someone came up to my station and asked for help, and I asked them to please be a little patient while I responded to the phone call, and I got written up for that encounter, because my boss said to never ever prioritize a customer on the phone when you've already got one in the store. And that's good advice, perhaps, but two weeks after that, I got fired by that boss while I was at the register, because I didn't meet my sales quota, and they did it in front of all of the customers. <laughs> And oh, it was the Christmas season, and boy, was I tempted to scream at all the kids in the store, Santa isn't real, all your toys come from here, it's all a lie, it's all a lie. <laughs> but I kept my head held high, walked out, and just a few short years later, Toys R Us went down the fucking drain. Rest in piss, you piece of shit. But anyway, deranged rant aside, Hank learns that Cotton has taken Bobby to the Hotel Arlen. And what's so bad about that? Well, back in the day, Cotton took Hank and his friends to the hotel, intending to buy them all prostitutes. 
And while I certainly don't have an issue with sex work itself, Hank and his friends were still in high school. Maybe they were 18 at the time, there are certainly some people who turn 18 while they're still in high school, so maybe it would have been okay. There is some wiggle room to this, so I can't say for sure whether or not Cotton was really in the wrong. I'm proud of you for what you did at school today, so I'm buying you a hooker! Go ahead, pick yourself out a live one! Okay, never mind. Cotton's trying to buy his prepubescent grandson a hooker. <laughs> That's pretty irredeemable, even for a fool like him. But as we see, the Hotel Arlen has gone through some changes. It has been transformed from a garden of earthly delights to a solitude of female trial lawyers. I was gonna make a joke about how it's been severely downgraded, but then I went and did a bit of research and found that trial lawyers are basically synonymous with defense lawyers, so I can't really make that joke. If they were prosecutors, then sure, but I tend to have a much higher opinion of defense lawyers. Maybe that's just the Saul Goodman propaganda doing its work, but I can't help but see a room full of Kim Wexlers here, and my heart does go a-flutterin'. Goodness, my mind does be a-wanderin' today. <laughs> anyway, Hank and Peggy confront Cotton and finally put their foot down. Even though Hank's dad does try to do some emotional manipulation with his shins, Hank finds his backbone and stands up for himself, his wife, and even a little bit for his mom, giving her praise for finding the strength to leave Cotton, and believe me, we are eventually going to have a long discussion about Tilly Hill when we get there. I have got a ton to say about her, both good and bad. In the final scene of the episode, Hank tells Bobby to just forget about everything his grandfather has taught him, and he honestly does a really impressive job of getting Bobby back on track. He says that Peggy is probably the smartest person in all of Ireland, even more than Dale, Bill, and Boomhauer. This shocks Bobby, and he asks how his dad can say that about his best friends. And now, I'm gonna let this clip speak for itself, because I think so many fellas out there, especially those so-called involuntary celibates, could really benefit from hearing this little nugget of wisdom. Peggy's my best friend, son. And when you're older, I hope you're lucky enough to find a girl to be best friends with, too. You think that'll really happen to me? Well, it won't if you keep slapping them in the butt and ordering them around. You'll do okay, you just have to remember one thing. Women were not put on this earth to serve you and me. Of course, this is still King of the Hill, so this bit of practical advice is lampshaded with this great joke about a roller rink girl coming up to take Hank's order. It's a really smart way of ending the episode, wrapping up a meaningful message in a joke about society, which always gets a laugh out of me. So that was Cotton's first episode, and how did it go? Well, for me, it did a great job in establishing much of what is so great about his character. The intent was to create an unforgettable force of nature, and they certainly succeeded in that. And if you can believe it, not once in this episode does Cotton bring out the whole I killed fitty men thing. They decide to lean much more into the shin thing, which tends to fall into the background as the seasons go. They got a ton of mileage out of it here though, burning through almost their whole tank in one go. This is also the most aggressively unpleasant that Cotton gets throughout the show, so if you made it through this one, then you're pretty much good to go for the rest of them. Something I really appreciate about this first season is just how confrontational it is. The plots are super focused on pushing comfort levels and trying to discover the limits of how far characters would and should go. A super squirter! The ha! Super squirter! There ain't no water toy, Mr. Khan! And so far we've gotten to see the limits of Hank, Bobby, Luann, Khan, and now Cotton, but now we've got to move on to perhaps the most defining moment for any character on the show. We did already have one Peggy-focused episode, but that was really intermixed with a larger discussion about sexual education. We need to see one where Peggy gets challenged in her own comfort zone. We need to see how Peggy reacts to a flesh and blood rival. We need to see Peggy have her own Peggy. My, my, what an interesting jacket. <laughs> Did you patch that together yourself? Why, you're at the very beginning of a rags to riches story. <laughs> that is going to be one legendary game of Boggle. Boggle? Already looking forward to it, and I hope you are too. In any case, for now, we can say that this episode, titled Shins of the Father, has indeed been reviewed to death. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Orange, you glad I didn't say banana? Huh? Huh? Everybody hates you.